All right. Good morning. We are ready to get going here. I've asked Brother David Ean to lead us in a word of prayer, brother. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this study in the book of Acts. Thank you for all the examples of conversion that we have to look at to see how we're supposed to go about converting people. Heavenly Father, thank you for the examples of leadership in the book. Thank you for all the lessons that have been taught this semester. Heavenly Father, be with the families of those who have lost loved ones recently. Be with all those that are ill. And Heavenly Father, help us to prepare for a good new year, faithful new year to you. In Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Enoch. <clears throat> so before we begin, as we always do, we'll recite our memory verse together. This is the last uh, day of the, of the year and for 2023. We're, our memory verse of this month was Hebrews 3.14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So today we are going to finish uh, our study in the book of Acts. It's been six months. It's hard to believe. I'm sure I speak for Stephen when I say we've really enjoyed uh, the six months uh, with you guys. I know personally I've learned um, a great deal, um, and it, it really, I don't know if you guys feel the same way. It never ceases to amaze me. You think you've read a book, you think you've studied a topic, and then you go back and you go through it, and you pick up so much uh, every time that you read a verse, a scripture, a passage, a topic. And so it's been really helpful to me to go through this book uh, in detail as we have. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, the idea is to, to learn more, to understand more, to get a greater appreciation uh, for our Lord's work. But also, uh, we had several objectives uh, for this study. As you see there on the board, uh, identifying the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, identifying the references to apostolic authority, uh, learning about the history of the church uh, and its work early on uh, in, the, in the history of it, and then learning from the conversions, as Brother Enoch mentioned, learning from the conversions and effective tools uh, for, for teaching others the gospel. And so hopefully we have met uh, some or all of those objectives. And so uh, as we left last week at the end of Stephen's class, he asked some really poignant questions that I hope you've had a chance uh, to think about, to some opportunity to meditate on. Those questions were, what events we've studied in Acts have most impacted your faith? Uh, what have you learned that you didn't know before? Um, how are you going to put this knowledge into practice? And then who are you going to tell about what you've learned? So I'd be really curious to know if any of you guys had an opportunity to think about this. I'd love to hear from any of you. And it's going to be really awkward silence if nobody raises their hands. So <laughs> I'm willing to endure that. But... Anybody like to share something that you've learned that you didn't know before, some impact that has had on you during this last six months? As I said, I'm very comfortable with the awkwardness of this situation. Yes, ma'am. The power of the Holy Spirit to spread the message from Jerusalem to the world through believers and the impact it had on their lives and the lives of others that they shared the news with. I, I love that, Vicki. Thank you so much for that. I don't know if y'all were able to hear that. To paraphrase the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to spread the news to others, and how that happened, and the impact it had on them and the others that they, that they brought it to. So thank you very much for that. <clears throat> the, uh, hopefully you found... Yes, J.D.? perfect machine that the plan that God had for Paul really was, to the point of even using his nephew <coughs> as a means to reveal the plot against him, and that the, uh, was a general or centurion, either way, that he was, uh, act, they believed Paul's nephew was able to get Paul out of that dicey situation. And furthermore, to that, the whole thing that happened with the temple when they were in the storm, how he quickly learned not to make the same mistake of doubting Paul, a man of the one true God, twice. 
So that was a, that, both of those were interesting stories where uh, God used uh, Paul's nephew to help inform about the impending ambush that Paul was about to, to be uh, subjected to. And then this last week about the tempest, the big, the huge storm, uh, that was truly, truly an, an amazing story. And I think as Benjamin mentioned um, last week in, in the class, uh, when we studied, when Max Dawson was here, it's like, wow, that, that, was a, that is a great leadership story. You think about him using his influence from the position. Was, he at, was Paul the highest guy on that boat? He was like the lowest guy on that boat with chains, and yet he was able to use his influence. Uh, we saw where they didn't listen to him and things turned out, and then when they did listen to him, how things were. Yes, Benjamin? Uh, last, last Sunday, going through Acts 27, <coughs> See what I may be able to do with this. Um, but sharing that chapter with people um, as a way of demonstrating the evidences that we have, the trustworthiness of the scriptures with, with all the details Stephen went through with the different locations, uh, the different places, and just how accurate Luke has been. He's been accurate in everything, but particularly this chapter, is just a lot there. And that would be a different starting place on helping one see the Bible is trustworthy. Yeah. I, I like that too. Luke was an incredible author, and the, the details that he went to. In fact, if you look back and you think about the different, just the different Caesars that we've come into contact with throughout the study, and Luke starts that off uh, literally in the book of Luke in chapter two with Augustus Caesar, and and, and tells us the time frame in which the census took place with Quirinius Car- being the governor of Syria, and then going on through that. The, just the level of detail that he included helps us to be able to validate not only a story, but when you validate that story, what else should that validate for you, the message behind that story. And so we'll see that today, as a matter of fact. Great thoughts. I appreciate that very much. Hopefully you found uh, this book also in particular can help you with any number uh, of situations you may encounter uh, when you're talking with others about Jesus, whether it's baptism, uh, whether it's benevolence or courage and perseverance in the face of persecutions uh, or physical, uh, physical ailments, physical per, uh, 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 tribulation, spiritual tribulation. But as we seek to continue Jesus' directive that came early, uh, in in the spreading the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world, uh, what things you know stand out to you as, as we as we as we study these different conversion accounts? Anything in particular regarding the conversion accounts? Down to you? Yes, Miles. The gospel is for all. He goes from the high to the low. He's healing beggars. He's talking to kings and Caesars, and just everywhere anybody he comes in contact with, if it kills him, literally, I, just everyone he comes in contact with. It's a great example for us, everyone in, in whom we come in contact with. There. Now, it's interesting also, his message changed somewhat when he had to talk to those different people, right? So he talked to the Jews in a particular way. He had certain emphasis that he made with the Jews. When he was talking to pagans or those who were idol worshipers, he had different, different focus on that, and his conversation was a little bit different and directed a little different. Does that have any bearing on us? Yeah. Knowing the background of that person, I loved also asking questions. What baptism were you baptized in? Right? So what, asking questions, getting the benefit of input before we just kind of launch into a, to a, to a, uh, to just assuming that we know what they know. Uh, so it's helpful to, to understand their background, where they're coming from. So good, good, good information for us there as well. And then the last two questions are really for you to ask yourself really for you to ask yourself, what are you going to do uh, with what we studied? We spent six months studying this material. How is it going to make a difference in how you live? How is it going to make a difference in how you talk to people, whether you talk to people? Can you see the power of the gospel at work still uh, in your life and, and then help others to see the gospel as well? So last week, uh, Stephen took us through this uh, really uh, harrowing uh, story of Paul's sea voyage that ultimately resulted in a shipwreck. And so if you think about that shipwreck, we, uh, J.D. already mentioned the tempest that was there. What, what stood out to you about that story, though? Ama- amazing story. Anything in particular that stood out to you from that specific story? Yes, sir. When people were trying to jump ship and you know, get away, and Paul says, like, no, 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 no. They have to be on this boat for God's power to work with us. Otherwise, it doesn't count. And it's, that's what we have. You have to be in the church for the work. You, those eight had to be on the ark to be saved from the flood. It, it, there's a was it somewhat conditional? Their salvation was somewhat conditional, you might say? Yeah. Somebody else over here thought that's all I am? Well, you see the providence of the Lord uh, throughout the entire book. You had an interaction uh, with the angel of the Lord, uh, but uh, you know, nothing miraculous with
was saving them. They had to, they had to trust in the Lord and you know keep uh, keep the commandments that was given. So it's really that's a really important uh, concept I think is when we look at. Uh, our definition of miracles, definition of providence of God. We can see the providence of God here. What about that specific story was, we would say, wow, that was a miracle. Wouldn't we say that? What was outside the bounds of natural law in that specific story? Was there anything that was, now I can't say that there, there wasn't some miraculous intervention, but we're not told of any miraculous intervention, David. Now that certainly was was uh, was miraculous. His connection with the Holy Spirit and with God, for sure. But the salvation of those people and the shipwreck of those people and jumping off and leaping off and grabbing pieces of pieces of plank, right? There's nothing miraculous about that. But what we did see was he saved how many people? 276 people. Not a hair on their head was lost, right? That's that is amazing. Uh, the, the, as, as Bud mentioned, you know, the soldiers about to kill the prisoners and the sailors trying to bolt uh, to kind of uh, deceptively get off the boat with the, with the, uh, the, with the skiff. Uh, so we finished chapter 27 with them literally leaping overboard. You picture this in your mind, uh, this boat cr- uh, cracking up on these rocks outside the, that bay uh, in Malta. <clears throat> And they're literally leaping overboard. Some who could swim, some who couldn't were trying to float across on planks or pieces of the ship. But they were, look at the end of chapter 27. The last, ver- the last sentence of verse 44. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Is that interesting wording? Think about that. They all, we would might say they all made it to shore. What does this verse say? They were all what? They were brought safely to land. <clears throat> so let's read uh, the beginning of chapter 28. Um, first, we'll just read the first two verses of chapter 28. <clears throat> oh, I didn't mention this, though. So, uh, our ABCs, you know, we had 28 chapters and we, and we only have 26 letters. So, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, kind of left out there. So you have to make up the, only, the last two there. Shipwrecked, and then th- today we'll talk about last heard of at Rome. And there's our uh, map, as you'll know, this week they were tossed and turned throughout the last, those two weeks here during the tempest, and they finally wound up landing <coughs> shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And Malta uh, is, a, is a, a, a small island, uh, uh, really about 18 miles long and eight, eight miles wide. Think about that, this very small uh, island here in the Mediterranean as we read the first two verses of chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. So as I mentioned, it's a small island, 18 miles by 8. I think Stephen showed some pictures of that. It's about 60 miles uh, south of Sicily. And the Romans had captured uh, this island in 218 B.C. It was the end of the Second Punic War uh, with Carthage. And the inhabitants of that island historically uh, were, were, were primarily of Phoenician ancestry. And so what do we know about the Phoenicians? They, they were seagoing people. Uh, they actually landed, and they're the, they're, uh, the, the, the precursors, the, the five cities on the coast of uh, Palestine, actually, uh, where the Phoenicians also landed. <clears throat> but the Phoenician language, Malta, was called Melita. Melita, and it's, I think it's also up on the, on, the, on the slide there. But Melita in Phoenician means place of refuge. Think about that. Was it a place of refuge for Paul and his companions? It certainly was indeed. So uh, Luke mentions... Uh, this unusual kindness. So, what were the, the three uh, what were the three acts of uh, or occasions of kindness, unusual kindness that were shown uh, to Paul and his companions? <clears throat> what was the first one? They had a fire. That must have been really important, right? They're coming out of the water, cold, uh, huge storm they'd been under. They hadn't been dry for over two weeks by that time. So they got a fire, and they were welcomed. That JD. Uh, here that they made them all welcome, so basically welcoming them as if they were neighbors they had known all alive or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think about that, uh, starting a fire, welcome to the island, 
uh, well, you know, get, helping them uh, whatever issues they had when they when they came out of the out of the ocean there must have been quite traumatic. Uh, we know later on, as we read, we'll get they stayed three days with the governor of the island, Publius. Um, they were three months on the island, and they they actually resupplied the very end of the chapter. We'll so or in the middle of it, we'll see that they were actually resupplied them uh, after their three month stay there on the island. So they really did show some unusual uh, kindness <clears throat> to them. Uh, during their their stay. So think about the miracles. We already talked about the providence of God and the shipwreck that just happened before, Uh, but think about the miracles in this chapter. Um, Let's read verses 3 through 10. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead, but when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him, And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. So what were the miracles in this chapter? The first one is that he had a viper crawl on his hand, and he would fast itself to him, and yet he was completely unharmed. In fact, he was even able to just flip the thing in not a single bite, scratch, any of the digits, but the venom had no effect. So that was the that was the, the, the first miracle. Paul was bitten by a viper and, and he, he survived. And it wasn't just a snake strike. Uh, you've probably seen pictures or videos of that or maybe even witnessed that yourself where a, sn- a snake will strike out. Uh, but this in this situation, the thing was actually fastened on his hand. I just kind of picture Paul, Paul you know, bringing these bundle of sticks and this snake, and he's like, okay, that's not good, right? And he just shakes them off, shakes them off into the fire. And, and the people, they're just like, man, this dude is in trouble. <laughs> he made it off the boat, uh, but the gods are not letting him off the hook. Clearly, this guy it must be a murderer. Now, uh, this is possibly uh, the venomous snake. That's, this is the, the, horn, the nose horned viper. Uh, it is endemic uh, to the Mediterranean, uh, and it has been found on another island called Melita. Um, that that uh, it's also on, found on the mainland uh, of Europe. Its toxin can produce immediate effects in humans. Um, it's quite dangerous, but while this is likely and possibly uh, the snake that, that is being referred to here, uh, there's a lot of controversy about this because Malta is not known to have a venomous snake on it now. And so the history of Paul in terms of the Catholic Church, when uh, in, his, uh, in his sainthood, one of the things that he supposed, supposedly did was when that he shook off the viper, he also got rid of all the viperous, uh, the venomous snakes on the island of Malta at the same time. So not sure about that, but just interesting to you know there is a lot of controversy because they don't, don't have this specific snake now on that island. Doesn't mean they didn't have it in the past, but this, this snake has very, very toxic venom. Uh, and has uh, and has been an, is endemic to the, the Mediterranean. So the next miracle uh, involves the governor of the island, Publius. So his father was ill, and um, he's described as having fever and dysentery. Now I'll tell you this: two unique things um, have happened uh, with Stephen and me teaching this class. First, I never thought I'd hear the words Vienna sausage in a Bible class, <laughs> but we got that last week. And then the second is that I never thought I'd get to show you an electron microscopy photo of a bacterium. But this is a uh, photo of electron microscopy of a bacteria, Cacobacillus, called Brucella melitensis, right? It is known to cause Maltese fever, Gibraltar fever, and it actually is, 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 continues to be a problem there, although they have a vaccine for it now. But at that time, it is, is traced to goats uh, back in the, in the 1800s, but this uh, particular bacteria absolutely can cause the symptoms that are described by Publius here uh, in, in the scripture of Luke. So Maltese fever still exists, was definitely uh, around at that time. So 
I will say that Paul has had a pretty rough go of it uh, for, for a couple of years. Um, the, what's it's interesting about those miracles, so we have the providential arriving on, on land from the shipwreck, we have the miracle of the viper, and we have the miracle of healing Publius, and then everybody else on the island who is sick. You know what else is amazing about that? That's the last miracle we ever get from Paul. We know he stays two years in Rome. There's not a single recorded episode of him performing a miracle again. Now he writes later, Timothy, don't ignore your gift, your spiritual gift. I'm assuming he did, but we don't have any record of it again. This is it. Paul's last miracles that are recorded in the scriptures. Well, as I mentioned, he's had a pretty rough go of it. Uh, we're told of the dangers he's faced, um, the physical punishment he's received. Now he's just been shipwrecked on this island. And there's this really kind of a three-month, this almost an interlude, a remarkable interlude on this island of Malta uh, where it specifically mentions the unusual kindness that's afforded him, the good that he did there in healing those people. And really, it's kind of a bright spot, <clears throat> a bright spot where Paul is refreshed after this incredible uh, sea journey, all the, the tribulations that he's had, and about, about what he's about to go into in Rome in his imprisonment. And so he's refreshed after pretty bleak two years. Let's continue our reading here. Oh, went ahead myself. Uh, here in verses 11 through 16. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up and on the second day, we came to Puccioli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when he came into Rome, when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him there. So, uh, they wound up uh, being on Malta for three months and were finally able to get uh, a ship uh, for, uh, from Alexandria that had ironically made a really good decision and had harbored there uh, for the, for the wintertime. Um, and they probably left sometime around early to mid-February. This would have been early to mid-February. Um, the, Pliny the Elder uh, mentions in his writings that sailing on the Mediterranean uh, begins early in the spring, somewhere around February 8th. So this would have been somewhere around early, mid, mid-February uh, when they were departing uh, from the island of Malta. And again, I think the detail that, that Luke affords us here really continues um, to really be fascinating. The ship he specifically mentions had a figurehead of the twin uh, uh, um, Roman gods, Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux were the sons of Zeus, and they were, ironically, considered the patron saints of navigation and good fortune. Why does Luke include that? I, re- I really don't know. I'm re- I, I, I just have to believe that Luke is kind of getting in a little dig maybe at the centurion, right? Should have listened to Paul. Now we're on a ship that has the patron saints of, good, of navigation and good fortune. Uh, even pagans, the, even these pagans had sense enough to get out of the rain, right? I, I, I don't know. Uh, but, it's, but it's interesting to me that he includes that level of, uh, of detail in this. Regardless, uh, they head uh, from Malta to, to Syracuse. And uh, Syracuse was a, a real, has a really nice protected harbor. Uh, so Syracuse is on the eastern side here of the island of Sicily. has a very nice uh, protected harbor. Um, and they stay there for three days. And then they sail for up, uh, across, so they sail up the coast of Sicily. This is the Strait of Messina and Regium, actually where that dot looks like it's on Sicily, the dot actually should be on the toe of the boot. Here's the boot of Italy, and then the toe of the boot is actually where Regium is across the Strait of Messina. And so uh, they, they sail to, to Regium, they put in at uh, Regium, <clears throat> and then um, they get a favorable wind, and it takes them about uh, two days of traveling. They then sail up the coast of of uh, Italy to Puccioli. And uh, Puccioli is a, uh, was a really important city. It was, this is about 200 miles up the western coast of Italy that they sailed. Um, and it's, it's, um, 
in the Bay of Naples. And so Puteoli was, was where passengers typically disembarked. In fact, at one time, it was the only port that was able to serve Rome until uh, they were able to put a new port in at Ostia. But here, this is still where passengers uh, would disembark. They would tend to take some goods up further, but passengers would embark, uh, disembark here, and then they would go north, catch here around Capua, and catch the Via Appia on into, on into Rome. Uh, there was already a church at Puccioli. Um, we know that. They somehow found these brethren. How long did they stay with them? Seven days. Probably worshipped with them. At some point, there was a Sunday in there, a Lord's Day, so they had a Lord's Day with the brethren there at Puccioli. And you think about that. So how many, how many churches do we know were in the Roman area at this time? We get one at Puccioli, where he's staying. He found some brethren there. Where else do we know that they're about to show up? <clears throat> we're about to get a group from three inns or three taverns. We're about to get a group from the form of Appius, which is about 10 miles away. So those are probably separate congregations. And we also know about one other congregation that he wrote a letter to in Rome previously. So we're here and we already know that there's probably at least four congregations in the area of Rome by the time Paul winds up getting there. Think about that. So even though uh, there's still about 140 miles from Rome, look what, what, look what Luke writes. They're 140 miles still from Rome, and what's he say? We came, and so we came to Rome. Why do you think he wrote it that way? He's a stickler for details. Were they in Rome? Physically? Not yet. They were about 140 miles away. Why do you think that he included it that way? It's interesting to me. Just because they're in the vicinity or speaking by anticipation. Okay, so, so I think there may be some anticipation or some relief. We're on the mainland of Italy. We've made it off the boat. <clears throat> we've, we've found brethren in Puccioli. We're in the vicinity of Rome. We're there. We made it, right? It was, had to be some amount of relief uh, and, 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 and just really... Um, satisfaction that they made it that far. And really, if you think about it, a f- kind of a foregone conclusion that they're going to begin going into, going into the city. <laughs> so probably like, where do you live? Or, you know, been, where, where's the church? It's in the DFW area. Yeah. People haven't heard Louisville or something like that. You know, so it's the idea of we're basically there. We were traveling recently and somebody asked us where we were from. We said, Texas. We also said Dallas. We don't live in Dallas. Right? But we do live in Dallas, as far as other people are concerned, right? So this idea, again, I, like, I, I appreciate that, Ben. Any other thoughts on that? So <clears throat> they, they, they get to the Rome area, at least, and though, even though they're about 140 miles. Um, and, and as I said, this, this really marks not only the achievement of Paul's desire uh, to get to Rome, but really a fulfillment of the prophecy. Look back just a couple of chapters. Look back at uh, Acts, the 23rd chapter, uh, Acts 23 and verse 11. You'll remember this. <clears throat> Paul had just gotten up before the Sanhedrin. Things are not going so well for him. And then the Lord comes to him uh, in, in the night, verse 11 of chapter 23. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And so he's making it. He is there. Uh, and perhaps that's why uh, Luke mentions Rome almost prematurely. Luke has, Luke has one more incident uh, to talk about, to relate before Paul actually steps foot in what we might think of as a city limits itself. Uh, but the word of Paul's arrival, what had happened? Kind of preceded him, right? Kind of got, to, got, to, got, got out. I'm um, not exactly sure how that happened, but he had spent, as, as Tim mentioned, seven days in Puccioli. And so during those seven days, maybe there's, uh, his, his c- comrades had gone out, his traveling companions, or word from the brethren in Puccioli. They may have sent uh, runners out to other congregations and said, hey, guess what? Paul the Apostle is here. And so you have this, this, this uh, one more incident that, that uh, Luke uh, uh, tells us about. Um, he's in Puccioli for this week, and then brothers from as far away as the form of Appius and three taverns come to see him. So uh, this map shows three, t- 
three inns here or three taverns. Uh, below that would be the form of Appius, so that was about 40 miles away. Both of those were really kind of travelers' towns where uh, people would, would overnight on their way into Rome or out of Rome. Um, but it looks like two different delegations from those churches came to greet Paul. They were separate cities. They were, you know, 10 miles away. That's not, we might drive 10 miles in, in a few minutes, but for them, that's a, that's a day's travel, right? So they were separate delegations that came to, to greet Paul. Um, as I mentioned, these were kind of stopping points on your way to or on your way from uh, Rome. What did this, uh, what did this, this, oh, that's a picture of Putiola. It's kind of a pretty town. So this is the port. Uh, this is the, the Bay of Naples, and then this is Puteoli in this harbor, uh, which was a very sizable harbor and protected harbor during that time. Uh, so that's a pretty little town. So, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, these two different delegations uh, c- come. What did this visit produce? So take a look at uh, verse 15. What did this visit by these brethren, think about the ordeal that you've in- endured, uh, and you get to the mainland of, of Italy, you're within a, a day's journey of, of Rome. And what does he? Well, he tells them to take courage, or he took courage. Um, there's some, some kind of confidence that he had, and uh, I think comfort um, and uh, thanksgiving that he experienced. So courage, it produced in him courage. Why do you think it produced in him courage, though? What, you know, going back to Acts 23, the Lord took them to courage. Yep. Then in Acts 27, twice, he told the people on the ship, take courage and be of good courage. Um, so why did it help him? I think just because of everything that he had been through, certainly being around brethren, uh, there is a source of strength yep. uh, and reassurance with that, that he wasn't alone and that everything the Lord had said had come to pass. I think that is the key to everything that the Lord said has come to pass. There's great comfort in that. There should be great comfort in us as we read that. that everything the Lord says is going to come to pass. There should be great confidence and great comfort in hearing that. So it takes courage. And then what was the other part right before that? What did he do? There was Paul what, did what? On seeing them, Paul thanked God. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Understanding where did this blessing come from? Ultimately, that came from God. God kept his promises. God protected them during the shipwreck. God's protected him on all of his, on all of his journeys. Yes, Miles? Well, I just, excuse me, think of any time you travel, if you like have a flat tire going somewhere or have really bad feelings <coughs> on a flight somewhere, and then you get to see your family finally, or you finally land, or you finally get to the hotel, or, you know, and, not that you ever want to have bad travels, but if you have bad travels, it makes getting to your destination that much sweeter. And so for Paul to go through everything he's been through and then see brethren and finally be on the mainland, like you said, then that just kind of like wipes all the past away a little bit. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Anybody ever lose their luggage? I've lost my luggage. This is not losing your luggage, right? He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. The things that this man has gone through for the cause of Christ is things that we can't even conceive of now. Yes, sir. So let's see. Um, he, had two, he had two weeks. He had three months. Let me go back here. We know he was three months here. We know he was somewhere between here and here, two weeks plus, right? So we're talking probably total of four months, three and a half, four months or so. You got anything different than that? Maybe a little longer. Maybe a little longer, yeah. Long trip. You're glad to get where you're going. Yeah. Think about this. I've also been seasick, but I've never gone two weeks without eating something. I mean, that was, that was something. Okay, so um, we, uh, we, we come to this uh, period, and we just mentioned that Paul offers up thanks. He's taking courage. Um, and you know, you think about also, he must have wondered how he's going to be received, right? He's never been here before. He's written to these people. He's wanted to see them, but he's never seen them before. He doesn't know what the, the situation is with the brethren. He doesn't know what the situation is with the Jewish leaders or, the, or the, 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 it, it, here in the, in the Roman area. Um, <clears throat> what's, is he in for any surprises? Uh, is he going to have to defend his apostleship? 
Is he going to be harassed by the by uh, Jewish leaders? What what's he going to face when he gets there? What's going to happen when he gets to Caesar? Right, all those things that must be uh, running through his mind. But uh, we know that he had written to the church uh, in Rome about three years before when he was in when he was in Corinth, um, and he was he had said, "Hey, I long to see you. I want to see you. I'm hoping to come see you before I get to Jerusalem." We know how that ended up. Right, and so that is finally happening. The rest of this account is really uh, a fairly extensive uh, narration, really, of, of Paul's encounter with these resident uh, Jews in Rome. We don't really get much more about uh, the, the the churches there in in Rome. What special treatment uh, did Paul receive? What have we seen already? What kind of special treatment did Paul receive? <coughs> yes, sir. Say that again. Allowed to stay by himself. Allowed to stay by himself. Totally by himself? With a soldier? Well, even before that, in Puteolium, he stayed with brethren for a week. If I'm guarding a sister, I don't want to tell him to stay with his friends for a week. That sounds like a recipe for a, you know, escape. Escape, yeah. So he, he got a week. And you, you wonder about Julius Centurion at this point. It's like, he got us, sure. You want to stay for a week? Let's stay for a week. I'm following your lead. <laughs> we should have been following your lead the whole time. So, yeah, so there's, there's a, a, amazing kind of latitude that Paul has had with his centurion, with his prisoners. He's, yes, sir? After seeing Paul kill all those people and the boxes on the ship, he, he knew he was in the, they were in the presence of someone special. So that's a really good yeah, that's a really good point. So what had they witnessed for the last three months on the island of Malta? A lot of miracles, right? Not just Publius, not just the viper, but everybody on that island that was sick came to see Paul, and he healed them all. That's what we're told. So the centurions, the guards, they were probably pretty confident that this, this was a man of God, right? And uh, that he was, a, he was truthful and, and um, wasn't going to try and escape. And really, you know, Paul's never made a... Made a has Paul said at any point, I'm trying to get out of this? No, he's, he's, he's on task. He's on purpose. He's on point. Focus is to get to Rome. Yes, ma'am. I, I think it's interesting when you think about the whole of, it, of that journey and all of his life. He goes through trauma after trauma and victim of violence and shipwrecks and all this kind of stuff. If we go through something like that one day and it like affects us for the rest of our life. I never lost his focus. Like, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. He never lost his faith. He never questioned. And I, I just think it's really amazing to see what all he went through. He was well on that stuff. He wasn't, you know, oh, I've, I've been treated so badly for me. I'm going to just go into my shell and never do anything again. It's a really good point. And in fact, we're going to see here in just a bit uh, about the letters that he wrote while he was in this two-year period uh, in, in, in Rome, uh, the incredibly upbeat message that he actually had during this period of time, despite the fact that he was in, in chains, imprisoned. <clears throat> so uh, Paul's allowed to stay with himself, has been mentioned, um, with the soldier that guarded him. Uh, there in, in Rome, there was a barracks or a camp for the Praetorian Guard, which is probably where he was, uh, who he was being um, uh, controlled by. He stayed on his own um, in a rented house, we're told later. He had some measure of freedom. What would we tend to call that? House arrest. It's like this idea of, of house arrest. Uh, instead of a little anklet, though, what was he? He was bound with a chain to his, to his guard. Um, and he refers to those chains, chains in, in multiple letters. Actually, take a look at uh, Philippians, the second chapter. <clears throat> this is a good example of that. In uh, Philippians 2, <clears throat> look at verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister for my, for my need, for he's been longing to see you. It goes on and talks about him being in, in chains uh, th throughout that, that time. But he also talks about uh, thanking them for the funds he received while he was where? In Rome. How did he get money? To rent his own house. He got funds from, from the Philippian. And we know that the Philippians had been the first to, to supply him with aid, right, on his journeys from Asia, uh, or from, from Macedonia there. So uh, he, he's 
thanking them for the funds he received for them while in Rome, and he's using those funds to help rent this house. Um, we also know that communities of disciples had already been established uh, at Rome before, before Paul arrives. It's obvious to us, right? So he meets a group in Puteoli. There's a group, a congregation, there are delegates that come from Forum of Appius, from Three Taverns. Um, those are not the, all, the only people we know that came from the church in Rome. Who have we already come across in the book of Acts from the congregation in Rome? Cole and Priscilla. Cole and Priscilla, right? Cole and Priscilla, they had been kicked out uh, of Rome, but we actually met Jews from Rome even earlier that became Christians. Where was that? The day of Pentecost. B, chapter 2, beginning of the church. Jews from Rome were there at Pentecost, right? And heard that message, heard Peter's sermon, and undoubtedly went back to Rome. At some point, went back to Rome. They were travelers there. They came to Pentecost, and you know that those people dispersed uh, afterwards, and they took the gospel with them. That's, they had to have been how they got the message uh, in some form or fashion. But the message had been spread. It had gotten to Rome and to that area. And as I mentioned, multiple congregations already. But we're getting to this point now where uh, Paul has, again, this inter interesting discussion with another group. So we've, he's met with these delegates from, from Rome, uh, these, these brethren, these saints, at these uh, multiple places. He's received uh, courage. He's taken courage. They've refreshed him. He gives thanks to God uh, for that. But now we read about this encounter uh, with the Jews that begins in verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will listen. So what did Paul say to the Jewish leaders? What does it tell us there that he said to the Jewish leaders? Is it a surprise? What has been his custom? Does it surprise you that within three days of coming in Rome, what does he do? He can't go to the synagogue, but what does he do? He gets the Jews to come to him. That's always been his, and he's always, it's always results in the same thing, right? Rejection. And then he says what? Turn to the Gentiles. He bring, and, and what's the message? The message is, is it's, does, so it doesn't surprise us. Um, and we know from the, also from the book of Romans that he wrote earlier, what does he have this constant urging for? What does he, what does he desperately want the Jews to do? Believe and obey. Believe and obey. It says that, in fact, it says in, in, the, in the book of Romans that he'd rather be cut off for the sake of his kinsmen, and that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish for their condition. What's that condition? They're the branches that have been cut off. And yet he says in Romans, what can happen? They can be grafted together. They can be grafted back. And that's what he wants for them. And so again, we see Paul not giving up on the Jews, but it's almost as if this is this final, final rejection. 
<clears throat> Paul gives a defense of his actions and, and, and why he's there to the resident Jews. They haven't heard anything. It's interesting. People have come from Jerusalem that the, the Jewish brethren mentioned. None of the brothers coming here has, respo- has reported. So we know that there are people that come from Jerusalem. They haven't said anything about you. Paul gives his defense, and he starts off by saying, this is, is a, again, kind of classic. Essentially, I was minding my own business. I was minding my own business, teaching, and then this is what happened. In the ER, it's always these two dudes that go around hurting people. I was minding my own business when these two dudes, right? If you could ever find those two dudes, you would decrease a lot of the crime that happens to people. But those two dudes keep going. But he's minding his own business. I've done nothing against our people or our customs. The Romans examined me, and what did they want to do? They wanted to set me free. Who else was, was uh, exonerated by the Jews, or by the, by the Roman leaders? Jesus, right? What happened? How did that turn out, right? Gave him back up to the, to the Jews and ultimately um, gave in to the Jews' um, desire to have him crucified. But the Romans examined me and wanted to set me free because of the Jews. It's because of the Jews I was forced to appeal to Caesar. I have been freed. The Romans wanted to set me free, but the Jews would have none of, none of it. So I was forced to appeal to Caesar to take, to take my rights as a Roman citizen <clears throat> to get out of what the Jews were trying to do for me. But what's the real reason he says he's in chains? What's the real reason? Because the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel. Think about that wording. The hope of Israel. What was the hope of Israel? Messiah. Is the Messiah. He's in chains because of Messiah. And really, this echoes his defense back in uh, chapter 23 and when he's before the Sanhedrin. It's because of the resurrection of the dead. Whose resurrection? Jesus' resurrection. Specifically, the man that they crucified. From his perspective, from Paul's perspective, he's in Roman chains because he's what kind of Jew? A bad Jew? No, a loyal Jew. That's his perspective. What is the natural outpouring? What should be the natural outcome of a Jew who realizes that the Messiah has come? Proclaim it to everyone. Take advantage of that. Recognize that. Believe that the Messiah has come. That's what a loyal Jew should do. He sees himself, he never sees himself as a bad Jew. Think about that. He never sees himself as a bad Jew. He sees himself as what a Jew should do when they see that the Messiah has come. The hope of Israel has come, and that's who he's proclaiming. He's preaching Jesus as the Messiah, as he's always done with the Jews, and as the hope of Israel. That's always been the key. That's always been his message to the Jews. Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. And the Jews respond. The Jews respond just like they always do. We've not heard anything about them, but we've heard about the sect, and it hasn't been anything good. They were absolutely familiar with Christians. Absolutely. That is kind of a little bit of a kind of a, um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a lie, but they've heard of the Jews. They've heard of the, uh, pardon me, they've heard of the Christian movement. Um, 30 years before the Romans that had been in Pentecost must have come back. It's recorded by the writer Suetonius. He wrote a book called The Twelve Caesars, which is interesting. It has a lot about Claudius and Nero in terms of the persecution of, the, of, of Christians. But Claudius expelled the Jews, Aquila and Priscilla. We know that around in the 40s, AD 40. But they expelled them because the, Jew, the Jews were rioting in the city of Rome because of this movement, the Christian movement. That's why they were rioting. So they knew about this. <clears throat> he reasons from the law the prophets, he gives his testimony, and the result, some are convinced, some are not. So once more, Paul proclaims, you kind of think, see this as they're walking out, Paul says, I want you to know salvation has come from God, and it's being sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. How effective was his teaching? Well, he had two years to teach, if you look in Philippians, the first chapter and the fourth chapter, we don't really know any details about uh, his appeal to Caesar. We don't have any record uh, of, of that dialogue or its outcome, but we do read other letters of his, his success. Members of the household guard <clears throat> uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, were, were numbered with the brethren there. 
So what epistles were written? Uh, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. He refers to himself being in change. Um, as I mentioned before, those are some of his most encouraging and upbeat letters, despite the fact that he's in prison at the time. Uh, the, he's, he's remarkably upbeat. He also expects to be released in uh, uh, Philippians, the first chapter, and in Philemon, verse 22. He says, prepare a room for me. I'm coming to see you, right? So uh, we don't know, uh, we don't have clear uh, evidence of this, but from historical writing, from reading Paul's own letters uh, to Timothy, it's most likely that he was released uh, after that two years and subsequently imprisoned again a few years later. He was ultimately killed by the Emperor Nero uh, in AD 67, shortly after writing the book of 2 Timothy. As Paul was a Roman citizen, would he have been crucified? No, he would have most likely have been beheaded after some period of imprisonment. We don't really know the details of what prompted that second arrest, although it happened after the fire in Rome, 6 AD 64 was the fire in Rome, and who did Nero blame that on? Christians, right? So there's a good chance that that has something to do with it. Luke finishes his book on a triumphant note. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The story of Jesus, our crucified Savior, has swept across the known world and is being freely proclaimed in the capital of the world. So Luke's task is at an end, and so is our time. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.